Thank you all so much for coming. First of all, I, I can tell you, Josh and Itamar, that I, there, not a day has gone by since I saw the ally that I haven't thought about the show. So, um, yeah, and, and I imagine all of you are like that. Just show of hands, how many of you have seen it? Okay, Whoa. great, <laughs> perfect. So we don't mm. need to explain too much. Then, then You can see it a second time. That's true, <laughs> until April 7th. Um, Itamar, I wanna start with you. I know you wrote this um, years ago. Can you tell us just, just to contextualize this, when did you write it? What was the, was there a specific moment that you thought this is, this is what needs to come out of my keyboard now? Yeah, I guess there's a couple answers to that. One is you're always sort of looking for um, things that feel like the, the way into something uh, stru uh, structurally or, or idea-wise or in terms of uh, attention, you know, the, the, the basic way a story starts is some sort of, there's a state of stability and then we're forced out of that for some reason. So anything that feels like a launch, you sort of catches your mind. And then there were a couple, this is probably in like 2015, 2016, that, um, that sort of my brain sort of got caught on that also felt personal and connected to aspects of my identity I hadn't written about that much. One was, I'm on a bunch of different, you know, Jewish, List, you know, related listservs from like programs I've done or things I've been a part of. And um, there was this sort of little argument flare up on one of them uh, between, that, that had uh, sort of had to do with like a generational divide around uh, the Open Hillel movement, which was a movement where um, students at colleges weren't allowed by the national organization, Hillel, to invite certain speakers. And these young people were like, we want to invite whatever speakers we want to write. And I was like, that makes sense to me, like those are my values. And then there were other people who were older um, who, who weren't saying necessarily like, no, don't invite whoever you want, but they were saying like, well, okay, but let's look at, let's think through the implications of what some of these people are saying, like whatever language they might be using, what is the upshot of what these people are calling for? And, and it was interesting to me to find my own internal compass like a little bit spun mm -hmm. by that conversation. So that was one. And then around the same time, um, there were uh, protests that sort of cropped up in Ferguson and after the shooting of Mike Brown in Ferguson. Um, and the Black Lives Matter movement sort of emerged from that. And then there was a fundraiser scheduled for Black Lives Matter at 54 Below, which is a performance space in Manhattan. And, um, and then Black Lives Matter is decentralized. It doesn't have just one manifesto. There isn't one thing. But at the time, this at that moment, a manifesto was released, and there were lines in it critical of Israel, and 54 Below canceled the event. And I thought, that's interesting, too, because I felt myself being like, well, is that a reason to cancel this event? And then I felt this other little voice in me being like, yeah, but why? And, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. So, so it, was, it felt like a launch. Like I could see it as the launch of a story, but I also felt like I could feel the division inside myself. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Um, so that's sort of what got me started and realizing those two inciting incidents could be part of the same play and how to, how to connect them was, was what got me started. And then the, the last thing I'll, I'll say is that it, then COVID happened and there was sort of a moment I was already working on the play, but I, I'm always working on a few things. But um, there was also a moment when there was this big reckoning in the theater about who has the right to tell what story. And, and I, I think when you really talk to actual artists, no one wants a world where no one's allowed to write anything except a one-man show about their own personal experience. Like, that's not what anyone's asking for, but like, but, it's like the bar is higher, right? right? If you're gonna, the farther you're gonna stray from your experience, you just have to be, no one should stop anyone from writing anything, but you have to be mindful, right? But with this, I was like, well, this leans all the way, at least in terms of the central character, into like my own sort of experience and all these, every facet of myself. So it was, it was all of that together that sort of got me going, yeah. And, and Josh, how about when you first read it? When did you read it? And because I know, you were, you signed on to do this before October 7th. So I'm curious what your impression was when you first read it. I thought it was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have read it though. I, I yeah. still have yet to yeah. read it. Yeah. But um, 
No, I... Um, Did you think so many monologues? I thought I, I should start memorizing this right now. Um, I got the offer about a year ago. I think it was March of last year. Um, I had done a workshop with um, Edomar at South Coast Rep of a play of his called Completeness, which I can't even remember what year it was. It was a long time ago. It was ago. like 10 years ago. Yeah, might, maybe longer. Yeah. I think I was, yeah. Um, but we had a very good experience with that week or two that we were together and had stayed in touch. And I just felt like um, there are certain playwrights that you, as an actor, you kind of have a mind meld with. Like I just, I understood intuitively and feel like I continue to just how to surf the very dense language that he writes. Um, it's not entirely dissimilar to the way I think and write, although it's a little, it's different, but I, I just had some intuitive sense. So I knew that Edamar and I were, uh, could collaborate well together. And then Lila, I knew socially just over the years, we'd worked at similar places and hung out. And uh, so when I got the offer to do, I'd always wanted to work at the public. I went, around, I went to NYU grad acting right around the corner and always dreamed of working at the public. So, you know, to get a, a play, before I even looked at the play, <laughs> Lila directing Edamar at the public, I thought I'm probably, I hope it's good, is what I thought, because <laughs> I really like the, the details around it. And then, um, and then I read it and it was like, duh, like, yeah, of course. Because I, you know, I trained, I mean, we trained across the board, but I trained as a classical actor, essentially, that's what they're really training you for. But I never saw myself as being like a Shakespearean Shaw kind of actor. I mean, I had to do that stuff in school and it was fine. But what I really, even as an undergrad, I, what I really saw myself as a theater actor doing original plays in New York City, playwright in the room, working on plays that felt vital and <clears throat> urgent and speaking to the moment. And this is like, I mean, this is literally, this is everything I, I dreamed of being in, in the theater for. Yeah. So uh, after October 7th happened, I... I mean, Itamar, what was the conversation for you about, okay, what, what, what do we do now? How, how do we, I mean, yeah. <laughs> obviously many conversations yeah. and thoughts aside from the play, yeah. but how do we now adjust or do we adjust? Do we change this, the time? I mean, you did set it at a specific time right before. Yeah. Um, so what was that exploration like? I mean, as you say, like the first, my first, Josh called me on the phone, I think a few, you called me like a couple, I forget when it was, but it was in a, it was like a few, it was like a week later or something. And we, we had a conversation that wasn't even really about the play. It was just like, it, it was about how f we couldn't even think about the play, kind of. It was like, um, yeah, so that was my first reaction was like, I know I have to deal with this, but um, I can't. I, the way I've said it before and is still true is like it was harder to think of a lower stakes question in that moment than what does this all mean for my off Broadway play. So <laughs> I was like, I, so I, I, but I was like, but it's irresponsible not to read that this train is like on the tracks. So then there was like, our, does the public still want to do it? Like it felt possible that we would say no, we can't. Um, and 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 then um, and Lila and I didn't. She was busy as she's always quite busy, but but we didn't. Lila and I didn't talk for weeks. I think. But we, I felt like we were having like a psychic conversation where we were like, we're going to have to talk about this at some point, but we're just not talking about it right now. And um, yeah, then it was a question of like, does this still have value? On, on the one hand, now that the conversations in it are on the editorial page of the New York Times every day, as opposed to quietly in the margins, which is where it felt like they were happening when I wrote the play, is there still, like, do, is it, is, is, the, is the soil now too, sort of well-tilled, or con on the contrary, is it too almost um, painful to ask, you know, audiences to sit through, but even before that, a cast to rehearse? Like, are we doing something irresponsible emotionally, psychologically to the artists in the room? But, and so there were all, and all kinds of other questions like related to those things. And so um, it was just a step-by-step -step process of like, we had meetings, we had meetings with the public, and we were all just like, we do think we still want to do it, but let's all be open to if anyone feels uncomfortable or changing our mind or uh, what, you know. And so we just sort of tried to create months before we started rehearsal among the, the artists who were already attached to the institution. And then it continued to get into when we got into rehearsal of just like, this needs to be a space where people 
don't have to feel like the play and putting the play on is more important than their emotional or psychological health. I mean, that's always true, but like this felt like, we really felt like we had to foreground that question. So that was one big thing. And then in terms of the question of whether or not to change the play, it became clear to me very quickly that I was like, okay, I have to be specific that the play is set before all of this because right. this has seismically changed everything. And so then it was just a process of rereading the play myself through new eyes to imagine myself as an audience member watching it now and, and being realizing much of it didn't need to change. And then anywhere, I'd, some, there were places where I'd got something, def, like someone predicted or said, well, obviously this will, you know, things that were definitively wrong. You know, I had to decide if that was intentional irony or foreshadowing or whether it just seemed like a mistake, like practical stuff like, like that. Um, it I think people might be surprised how little the text of the, cha the play changed, but where it changed, it changed in ways that were important, I feel like. What was it like when you went back and reread it with, with the perspective? Did it resonate differently with you? It, I, it was so hard. I'm so close to it. So yeah. I knew it was hard for me to tell. <clears throat> um, I didn't look at the play at all for about a month. So it was like sometime in November that I picked it up again. I just did it very slowly. I took, it took me like a week mm -hmm. um, where I would just like do a scene or two a day and then put it down and go through it page by page and just be like, does, it was like, yeah, it was like touching something I didn't know if it would be like hot or electrified or something. Mm -hmm. And then I kept being, there were, you know, there were places where I would just reread a page over and over again, being like, I think this still, like bringing myself forward into the present and like, yeah, it was, it's not, it's unlike anything I've done before, I would say. Yeah, yeah certainly. Josh, what about for you? I mean, did it feel <clears throat> like, did it give you pause about doing it, about this is so raw? Or did it make you eager to kind of dig in and explore how you connected to this character and the topic? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not sure. Like. Um, we had, a, we had a lot of talks about it. I remember you saying, I don't know if I have the most important play in the world or the least important play in the world suddenly, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. like, I did, yeah. and I, I like you said something, you know, that after October 7th, the, the play became a period piece. Mm. It was no longer about this, it was about this, the moment before this moment. And um, no, I, I, I didn't feel at all that it was any less worthy of, in fact, I felt more called to do it and to do it well. I mean, that was, that was always the call for the piece was not to say we did it perfectly. It has to be done with such like delicacy and care. And we, we took really, you know, Lila um, especially, but she, cause she was kind of the, you know, she was our leader, but we had to take very good care of each other throughout the process mm. because, um, you know, when you're dealing with issues of identity and the, the, the political and the personal, just, you know, sometimes dancing and sometimes slugging it out, it was, um, yeah, it was, but there was something about the way we approached it. Um, you know, I still, I mean, I, I have a sense of like people's political views, and but we never once went around the table and said, what do you think about Israel? Well, <laughs> what do you think about, like, none of that. Right. It was, we, we approached it like, we were in a yeshiva and this was our, the Talmud, like we were really digging under the text and we were trying to, we were around the table for longer than I've ever done table work. It was like over a week and a half and I was like, are we gonna stage this thing? Like I, <laughs> I have to get on my feet. But once we did get on our feet, we knew it, we, we, we were underneath it and we really, um, because the other, the other thing you wanna be sure of is that it doesn't feel like we're just walking op-eds. Each of us are just yes. kind of like a talking head for a point of view. They have to really feel like flesh and blood characters who are, who are political. Their their, poli their politics is is emerges from who they are. You know that's something I think that um, that I think the play really gets at is like we find our politics because of who we are and and how we see the world and what formed us and where we were hurt and where we're looking for you know protection or allyship or whatever. Um, so I it was just like a. It's hard for me to remember even before we started the process of working on it because I've, it's been so immersive and I needed, I had so much to learn that I needed to immerse myself. I knew that I needed to know this script better than I'd known any script ever. It had to be this kind of cellular thing or I, 
like I, I just, I, I would have like pre-actor nightmares mm -hmm. of like, if I lose the plot, like in the middle, of, like I'm gonna, it's a runaway train, like I have to really be <laughs> on top of it. So um, it's weird, I approached it incredibly technically on some level, like just trying to metabolize these words and get, but it was also like a highly emotional process all at the same time I found myself welling up with tears when other people would be doing their speeches or when I would do mine. There, you know, there was a moment that um, in the scene with the rabbi that I got very emotional in rehearsal just around the table. And it doesn't happen every night, but I've continued to have this surge of, and Itamar was gonna change that line. I said, you can't change that line. That's where I, <laughs> so it does something to me. So please don't change it. What's um, the line? I don't wanna say. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, I, I, I really feel like this role, I, I've stopped answering your question, I don't remember what it was, <laughs> but I really feel like this role, it didn't just demand It every, was where did you have lunch? <laughs> <it> was, <laughs> sweet green, we can go on. No, it didn't, it, it demanded everything I have learned in my, however long I've been a professional actor, everything I learned at NYU, but it also, everything I learned from growing up Jewish, uh, uh, all my kind of political, um, whatever that, you know, ther everything I've done in therapy, like everything was usable and everything was actually required. Mm -hmm. Like I've never, I've never had a role that required this much of me and not just like acting, but like a whole host of other things, you know, empathy. Like I always, I think of, I think of my job as being like a professionally compassionate person. Like, like I, I, I have to say like, what would it be like to not be me? What would it be like to be this guy? Now there are some overlaps between Asaf and me and Itamar, but some of it's different. And I think that that's like a very holy question and I wish it was one we asked more. What would it be like to not be me? Mm -hmm. What would it be, what's it like to be you? Um, I think that's how plays start. What would it be like f for, to not be me, you know? Yeah, can, can you tell us a little bit, you, you said that the time spent around the table before you even staged it, was it that you were, you and the whole cast, you were all digging into the words? Was it the emotional conversations about how do we feel about this? I mean, I'm so curious about how, um, how the cast and, and Lila Nugabauer, the director you've both mentioned, how you navigated this people have strong feelings. You're playing characters, and characters have strong feelings, and the actors have strong feelings, and how that was navigated. I mean, you can answer this too. I, yeah. I, I feel like it was, like when I say it was Talmudic, it really was, okay, there's the line, but why are you saying the line, and what does that line mean? And we had a lot of questions. There's so much history, there's so much, you know, we had a dramaturg there, we had a library of reference books, and um, it was really like, you wanna be sure, even there, if there's an interjection, which there are many, <laughs> where I say, well, but, mm -hmm. and I would say, Edomar, what am I about to say there? <laughs> Why? You know, and then I have to trace back, oh, that's what, and the other thing is, um, I didn't do this exactly, but I, I almost wish I had, but I've done it more throughout the run of the show. Asaf is like, whoops, Asaf is, um, his great virtue, I see, is that he has a very elastic mind and he hears people and he can get underneath their argument and he can understand, but that also makes him very malleable mm -hmm. and kind of, um, he can be pulled to what, because he's, he's got a big uh, empathetic imagination. That's a virtue, I think, but in this play, it's essentially his tragic flaw. Yeah. You know, it's like everyone else is carrying some sort of flag of certainty that he just doesn't have. But he wants to be, an, and then when his back is against the wall, he, he is shocked to discover that his reflex is to go towards his tribe, is to say, I, I'm Jewish, I, 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 I'm concerned about Israel, I'm, you know, all this stuff. And um, so for me, one of the things I really had to do around the table was, if you, if you look at the play, he takes the, P, the point of view of the, the character he was just in the scene with and he brings it into the next scene. That's his point of view, almost in the next scene. Yeah. And he almost directly quotes people as if it's his thing. He says, oh, don't yes. they say? And it's like, your wife just said that. Yeah. Um, 
But I really had to track where he was grabbing other people's arguments and where he starts synthesizing his own. Um, that was really important to me. And that was a lot of that was around the table. Yeah, I think what Josh said about his approach to memorizing or to learning it being technical, Lila, I think, very smartly did something similar with the table work, where it was just, let's make sure we understand everything that we're saying. And it turns out, um, if you simply start there, you end up getting to all these deep questions about, you know, history and also like personal identity and, you know, the the meeting of the two for each character, but that begins simply by saying like, okay, what, why, you know, and they're, okay, this, you know, he says this thing here, she doesn't refute it there, she refutes it two pages later. Why doesn't she refute it in the moment? Why does she wait? Why does she when, when it comes up again? You know, just these very technical questions. It's challenging for me sometimes because it's easy as a playwright to interpret those questions as like, does this not, this doesn't, so it doesn't make sense? So like, oh, so I should rewrite it? Um, and it's like, no, 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 we're just trying to understand. Um, and so I think that that was. But sometimes we were saying rewrite it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. right. Josh, Josh, uh, it's interesting because Josh is a, he's a, Josh was a very smart, uh, don't listen for a second. Josh is an incredibly smart actor. Um, but that doesn't, that's not to say but? that. But? No, and, it's not but, and. And. It's, no, but, but in contrast to many actors who, where that means their approach is kind of cold or cerebral or technical. Josh's approach is also very emotional and intuitive. And so whenever he asked for a rewrite, it wouldn't even be him asking for a rewrite. It would be him being like, when I get to this part of the speech, my body feels as though it needs to generate an energy that is not organically come, you know? And he, he, we, we, one of the books in our reference library was the body keeps the score. And our joke was like, right, Josh's body is keeping the score on where I need to, re to cut lines or change lines. My wife and I have a joke about that book, which is some books are so perfectly titled, you don't need to read them. <laughs> and the body keeps the score is like, we get it. Like, we don't need, I get it. I'm, I'm not going to learn anything that I haven't learned from the title. <laughs> I'm sure it's a great book. What, what were the resource books that, that you gave? To the, and, I, and I'm so curious. Tell us a little bit about the research that you did while writing. Um, well, in the room, I didn't provide the books for the room. It was a dramaturg and, and uh, you know, the sort of people whose job that is at the public and on, and on the production. And it was everything. I mean, it was everything from, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know Dara Horn's uh, People Love Dead Jews to Rashid Khalidi's The Iron Cage and everything in between, you know. So uh, it was this, it, and it grew over the course of rehearsals. There were like more and more books on that table yeah. um, over the course as the weeks went by. And... Um, and they were all also in like a Google Doc that, the, that, that we could all access. In terms of my own research, um, I began with what I already knew, which was a fair amount, and the stuff that I could just sort of spit like on my own. And then as it became clear what the play required, like, okay, I need the piece of the puzzle that fits in in opposition to this, or, you know, what's the, even, it's just sort of like building the, it's like, like writing a play is like building a bridge across a chasm, sort of, but you're like, you're putting the neck, you're, it's until you're partway across, you don't quite know what the next piece is. So then it was like reaching, reading, you know, seeking out information about specific things or specific people who, who knew more about this or that, um, at, you know, listening to podcast episodes about, um, you know, very granular aspects of the conflict or about, about you know, social justice or about, um, you know, the media's biases this way or that way. And yeah, it was just like, at, the play taught me what I needed to look into more deeply whenever I knew I, there was a gap. Mm -hmm. yeah. What were the questions that the cast had for you around the, in those early rehearsals or table readings? I'm trying to remember. Um, I don't, re it, it was such an intense process and I almost feel like <laughs> my brain has, has yeah. wiped it in some way. I don't remember the specific, I don't, rem I don't know if you had this experience too. I, I, I just, I remember the feeling, I remember the emotional landscape of the, in, like the first two days in that room feeling very intense in an almost overwhelming way. Like, I don't know if I can do this. And then like the trust building among the group to such a degree quite quickly that the room just felt like really loving. Mm -hmm. I remember that more than I remember yeah. specific. Yeah. yeah. I had a moment, I mean, this is somewhat related, not entirely, but I, I had this moment where it was the first time we ran act two mm. and, um, and we finished 
and it went, it went well. And then I felt that uh, everyone was mad at me, the cast. I was just convinced everyone was mad at me. <laughs> and because um, I, I, I tried to like make eye contact and people averted their eyes. And, um, and so then Lila just gathered us around and she said, I don't want to talk specifics. How is everyone feeling? And I said, I feel like everyone hates me. <laughs> and I said, I, and I feel incredibly lonely right now. Um, and everyone just was like, wait, what? You know, everyone was so lovely. And they said, we were just trying to let you have your own process. And, um, but it was, um, I, I sometimes, it's a very confusing thing that sometimes you're like, am I experiencing what my character's feeling? Yeah. Or am I experiencing what I'm feeling? You said it in that moment. I remember you, were you saying that and saying like, you said, I know that a certain amount of that is bleed. Yeah, you said. yeah. But it was also, the cast has said to me that that was a very important moment for them because they realized they could be vulnerable and bring their whole self and say what they were feeling. And I, those are the environments I want to both work in and help cultivate because I think, especially for a play like this, now you, you, you can lose a lot of hours doing therapy in a play around a table that is not all that helpful. You know, you don't want to get too in the weeds of that stuff. But I do think that it was really helpful for uh, us. Even I, I, I taught them this thing called checking in that I, <laughs> I learned from a men's group that I'm in, which is where you just kind of scan your body for any physical and emotional thing. And you just share it, and you share it without comment, and you say, I'm here and I'm in, you know? And we do this now, Tuesdays before the week starts, we do it Sunday before the matinee. And people really, I think there's something about, um, especially in a time when I think a lot of the hurt out there and, and in here is like, people feel like they're not being seen yeah. and heard just at a very basic level. And that's why people are raising their voice and that's why, you know, so there's something about creating a container where you're making something together that it felt so important to say, like, I see you, I hear you, like, tell me how you're feeling, I'll tell you how I'm feeling. Vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the, the writing, I do remember there were, there, were, there were some facts that were inarguably true, that were fact-checked, that were <laughs> scholars agreed with them, where I would say to Itamar, I feel like I'm hurtling down the road and I have to pull over and scoop up this fact and put it in the back of the truck and then keep going. And I said, I just want to keep going. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So there were, there were certain things that felt, yeah, they felt like, I, I, I understand this is true. I understand why you want to put this in, but it, it's like, I can't, it, it feels like too much labor to pull over and grab it. It's, it's interesting because then it, it always turns out when the, when the cut is a good cut, that, that it isn't just that, Dramaturgy works in this really like mysterious, powerful way where your favorite speech or your most important factoid or whatever that's super interesting on its own terms that you want to get in there, you have to cut it if it doesn't work in the flow of the action because the audience literally can't, they won't take it in. It's like showing someone a beautiful painting with the, in a pitch black room. Mm. Like the action of the play is the light. So like, so it's like, but it's the most beautiful painting. And you're like, well, then figure out how to get it into a room with light in it. Because right now it's in the dark. And so it's like that. It's like, yeah, the things that were not, and not everything that's true is relevant in, or relevant in that moment. There always turns out to be, if something works, it's always because this person needs to say this to this other person in this moment. And if there's any reason that they don't, you can't keep it. So there's yeah. a lot of that. Too. that was that's on every play. One of my impressions watching the, the show was that you, you have this sense that everything that is coming out of the mouths of these characters, it has to come out. Like they will die if they don't say this thing. And there's, there's um, something so powerful about that. I'm curious about, because I know that there were different, you were working on mm -hmm. the ending for, I mean, up until pretty close to you opened, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, so <laughs> very close. How, <laughs> what was the moment, I thought the ending was so powerful and beautiful, and what was the moment that you said, oh, okay, I got it? Th so this, well, the truth is I had it the whole time. It was right there in front of me. Um, I just didn't know it. but. Um, there's a, no, it's a very specific, interesting story because, I mean, it's not interesting. You decide if it's interesting. <laughs> it's a story. Let's start there. This, and it's brief. The but the story is, 
we, st I, you know, until there is a level of, of knowledge you simply don't have about a play until you're doing it in front of a live audience of not your, your friends and people that work at the theater, right? A live audience whose only agenda is, we've come to see this play and we would like for it to be a good play, right? And the group mind created by that audience is the smartest thing in the world. And it will, you know, any individual person in the audience might get this or not get that. The group mind created by a real audience is smarter than any writer, it's smarter than any director. So you have to listen to the, en the energy in the room. And I could feel from the, from the invited dress rehearsal in the early previews that there was an electricity that was building that seemed to peak in the scene between Josh and the rabbi, which is now the play's final scene. And the play had two additional scenes when we started previews. And I could feel something ebbing about the audience's connection to the play or something that, you know, you can just feel it. And I thought, okay, I've done something wrong in one or both of those scenes. And so in early previews, I rewrote them various ways. Um, and what became clear to me and is obvious in retrospect, but was not obvious to me till quite late is that, and uh, many people raise their hands, so I'm not spoiling the ending of the play for, for most people, but essentially we get to a scene which was the third to last scene in which he's presented with what's essentially the sort of core choice. Right. And I realized that continuing the play after that point at all was impossible to do without in some way moralizing or pointing to a concrete answer that in my heart I don't feel I have completely have, and the difficulty of arriving at that answer is in a way one of the play's points or one of the things it's investigating. And so if he does X versus Y, and if he's rewarded versus punished, there was no way to do any of that without the play saying something that I realized I myself didn't believe, no matter which iteration it was. So very late, like we were like two days from freezing the play, I think, for, for press, we lopped off the, the two final scenes. So there were many different endings in the sense that I rewrote those scenes multiple times, but the final change was simply to remove them and to massage the very end of the rabbi scene so that it felt a little bit more like an ending. What were the two other scenes that you cut off? There, I mean, they were a, a multiple versions of them, but in every version it was a, another scene with his wife, mm -hmm. uh, where there were versions of her, you know, different extremes of how let down and angry at him she was. <laughs> and, uh, and then another scene with Reuven, the, um, the, the graduate student, the PhD student in Judaic studies who has a long scene with him at the end of the first act, coming to him again and saying that he's now starting a club that he wants uh, a soft to sponsor and him saying, you know, and then there were many different versions of how he responds mm -hmm. to that, like, no, you know, um, at various levels of heat and, what, and what's, you know. But it, it always felt, I mean, you were trying to play it and I know you felt something similar that like, it just, there were, I eventually realized it wasn't which version of it was right. It was that the play was already over, mm -hmm. you know, and that I was doing stuff that actually maybe I wanted to just leave in the, in the air, you know, I don't know. Did you feel that as an, as the actor? Yeah, but I didn't know it until I knew it, right? Yeah. Like I, I, once he cut the scenes, I said to Itamar, I said, for all the many lines and speeches I have in this, and, and, my dialogue in those last two scenes was relatively spare con yeah. uh, compared to the rest of the play. And I, I had the hardest time memorizing those two scenes. And that's another thing of like kind of paying attention to your body. Like I could, the body, it keeps the score. <laughs> and, and I couldn't, I, they just wouldn't stick. And he said, yeah, because they don't belong in the play, you know? <laughs> and I think there's also something, and maybe I do, I do feel, and maybe it's running it, but I feel much less punished by the play without those two scenes in it because I did feel like after the rabbi scene that I just was walking in into, you know, <laughs> just, you know, so, you know, my wife's waiting for me and Ruben's waiting for me. So, um, I agree that there was a kind of, um, uh, po you know, a, a, a possibility of a kind of moralizing that, that Edomar really wanted to avoid. And I also noticed when I get to the rabbi scene, in the second act, I need a rabbi in that moment. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I, Asaf needs a rabbi, I actually need a rabbi. I think the audience might need mm -hmm. some clergy mm -hmm. help in that <laughs> moment. And Sharice, I think, I think her, Nakia is gorgeous, but that rabbi is just like a grand, I don't know, there's something about that rabbi that I just find so lovely and so um, 
just wise and patient. And, and I felt like her, her gift to Asaf and the audience is, you know, this notion of like, maybe you don't, maybe more words isn't what you need, that, that these words have taken you as far as they can take you and you keep hitting dead ends and locked doors with them. So maybe it's time to go in and be quiet. And I think that that's perennially good advice, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Was it always um, your intention that the same actor, Sharice in this case, play Nikia and the rabbi? Yeah, in every draft of the play that's been specified, um, I, I, um, I like, like I, I mean, I think a lot of, you know, any playwright probably like enjoys this particular magic of theater and the particular games of theater and doubling is a, is a device we accept, but I don't like it when it's arbitrary. I like it when it means something. Um, and, uh, but then also, so, so uh, but then also it sometimes emerges from practical considerations. So I remember writing the first draft of the play and getting to that point and being like, I think now he goes to see the rabbi and all I'd said about the rabbi, like his wife says something, like, here, the rabbi's cool. And the first thing, we know not the rabbi could be anybody. And I remember thinking, like, well, it's a cast of seven. And I don't want, I mean, no one's going to want to pay another actor <laughs> to, sh to show up in this last, you know, for one scene late. And it also just felt, it felt a little arbitrary. And then I was like, well, who are, yeah. And, and so then I, very quickly, I was like, I should double this with another person in the play, and there was a little bit of a, like a producerial concern coming out. But as soon as I thought that, I was like, well, let me see which choice exploits this for the greatest aesthetic payoff. And as soon as it struck me um, that uh, it could be doubled with the, with the actress who plays Nakia, I was like, it was interesting to me on so many levels, because it, it, you know, it sort of expands instantly in a moment, like this sort of the, our, our, what we're seeing in terms of what Jewishness can look like. And then there's someone said to me, I thought this was beautiful, this wasn't explicitly my intention, but someone said, you know, it's almost as if you could read that scene almost as a dream in which his lost love comes back to him in this other form that is the most accepting possible <laughs> form who just wants to listen to him and give him as much time as possible to deal with his own concerns. And I was like, but I think, it, I think it, that is one of the ways the scene works. I don't think it's like, there's a, like it's all a dream. But, um, <laughs> but so I, yes, so I, I made that choice consciously and it, felt, it always felt right to me, and I sort of never questioned it from the first draft, yeah. I appreciate the Bobby Ewing reference. Well yeah. done, well done. Um, what of the audiences, I'm so curious because when I saw it, there was actually a moment where um, some people started applauding after, I think it was after like Ruben's um, monologue, and it was like, it was so jarring as an audience member to hear that. And I was curious if at other shows are people, what is the reaction that you're hearing from the audience members? Well, <laughs> early on, we had some, I mean, we've had some vocal, what's happening? Oh, oh audience oh. questions. Yes. <laughs> Keep getting interrupted. <laughs> Um, early in previews, we had, um, during Fareed, um, his, uh, part of, um, it wasn't his big speech, but early in the second act, when he starts pushing back against some of the stuff I'm saying, there was a moment where an older woman just said audibly from the audience, just said, bullshit. My friend Ryan happened to be seated next to her, <laughs> and he told her to be quiet. <laughs> and she was the rest of the, um, the, the the next night, at the exact same moment that that Michael was doing that. Literally the exact same moment, a bunch of uh, people started snapping and clapping in support. Um, so we were, at that point, we were like, we, okay, we, we're off the reservation. We don't know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and there have, uh, the, the most jarring one was, um, is this something I should even I talk about? Up to you. I don't know. <laughs> Someone walked out and said, and shouted something at us. And I, uh, I had my back to her. And it was, it was very unsettling. And, and I kind of lost my place. I was able to find my way back. But... Um, 
you know, we, we, we didn't know what it would do. There, you know, sometimes people applaud after Reuven's speech. Sometimes they applaud after Fareed's speech. Sometimes they applaud after Barron's speech. No one applauds after any of my speeches. <laughs> but, but there's, um, they do it at the end. I get a nice, yeah. um, but uh, I, I, I think that, you know, it's a provocative play. It's right. designed to provoke, and I don't mean that in any shoddy way. I mean that in a real, genuine way. And as an actor, you want everyone to just, you know, <laughs> laugh at the right moments and gasp, but don't scream at us, you know. Um, so I, I, I think, like, we don't know when something's going to happen. It actually seems like uh, it's, um, I think the audiences are coming because people have sent them. Yes. I think the later audiences are people, my friend told me, insisted I have to see this play. So I think people are coming with more of a reverence on some level. Like, I don't, I don't feel like anyone has come with the intention to disrupt or any yeah. of that. And it has been relatively rare. The real disruptions have been very few. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. What was the tenor of what the person was? Was the person <laughs> angry? No, I'm really curious. Well, um, yeah, I don't want to go into that. Okay. Yeah. No, no, yeah. That, that's, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, and what about afterwards? What if, you know, I know I, the show I went to, I saw that you were coming out and talking to people, and I'm curious what the, what are the things that people are saying, saying to you and to the, I saw Michael, I saw um, Sharice, they were, I'm curious what, what were the conversations that have resonated with you the most? Yeah, well, one that really stuck with me after our first preview, our assistant director introduced me to a friend of hers, and she said, um, she was, I think she was in her 20s, and she said, I stopped talking to my uncle years ago over these issues. We just, you know, um, and seeing this play and hearing the different perspectives, I, I understand more where he's coming from. And I don't know where it will lead, but I'm going to reestablish communication with him. Wow. And I just thought, if theater's capable of any kind of goodness in the world, it's those kinds of things, you know? Um, there's a lot of, there, it seems like there's a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of Jewish people come up to me and kind of like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, and there's a feeling of, <laughs> it feels like they're grateful one, for, for me, and I've been told this, I'm not projecting this, but like that I'm embodying a kind of anguish that they've been feeling for a long time. And I think they're grateful that, that um, on, a, on a stage where they can sit in the dark and just be with the feelings of that. I also think that there's, I think more broadly, it feels like, like people are grateful I think so much of the, the dialogue about this, especially on social media, it's very first draft, it's very angry, it's very fiery and inflammatory, and if you're not with me, you're against me, and blah, blah, blah. And it's so, I, I, I just feel like for someone like with a, an elastic mind and a big heart and a, and a love for um, you know, Judaism and a, and, a, and a belief that everyone should live peacefully, and um, it's, a, it's a very hard time, so I think there's something about, um, Edomar's worked on this play for so long that this is not a first draft of anything. This is like, this has been vetted, this has been run through <laughs> scholars across the board. And I think um, the ability, you, you know, I always tell people, except if you're a, you know, white nationalist, Christian fascist, you won't <laughs> like this play, because there's, there's a moment, we just throw you under the bus. But everyone else, there's a, there is at least a monologue in here that will make your heart sing, wherever you are politically. Yeah. And you, you have to also sit and hear things you do not want to hear and maybe often don't hear. I had an Israeli friend come and he said, I learned something about the Palestinian perspective that I did not know, and he knows quite a bit. So I think there's some relief that there's some sort of civilized container where people can listen to all of this and hear things they disagree with and also Oscar has made this point a few times. There's no violence in this play. No one punches anyone. No one slaps anyone. There's no, it's, I mean, words are weaponized, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a battle of ideas. 
but I think there's just, there's been some palpable relief among people that I've talked to, to have this all laid out so clearly and cogently and also not have there be villains. Yeah. You know? I'm curious, Itamar, how does that resonate with you? Because here you wrote, and, and though you did make it a period piece, mm -hmm. it's impossible for an audience to, or I, I, I don't know, I think it is to, to just be, um, an audience member watching something because this is so much in in the news cycle in all in our worlds how how do you kind of draw that line between this is a a a work of art this is a play mm -hmm. and this is what's going on right now in the world i mean i in a very real level like i'm not in any control of like how people receive it or the impact it has. Like I'm very, I'm, I, I, you know, Josh is sort of there doing it every night, encounters people in the lobby. So I'm not hearing from people as regularly and as in as great numbers as as he is. But I, I'm hearing similar things. Like people said a, a thing that multiple people have said to me is that there was a knot inside of them that the play began to untangle mm. or something. Or it, the, yeah, the the feeling of relief he describes. So I'm very. Um, kind of moved and grateful that it's having that impact. I can't say that I, I was like, you know, constructing it in the lab being like, and here's a, here's a machine for untangling the knot inside. Like I was sort of, I guess, picking at the knot inside myself. I guess this is how this works. You sort of like, you do a, a deeply personal thing and then everyone's like, yeah, why did you read my journal? And, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so I don't know, and the, and the news is, you know, has it was one thing in October and one thing in December, and it's changing every day. So, um, yeah, I, I I don't. It is not up to me to draw that line. Like I, th this thing is is out there now, functioning at, in whatever way it is, and people seem, for the most part, um, they seem to feel, you know, uh, in places spoken for by it. Or and spoken to by it, and um, so I don't know. Like I, I, I don't. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I wasn't. Yeah, I, I have never felt in control of the relationship between this play and the real world. I guess is my answer. I've never <laughs> had an experience being at a play where, as soon as the lights go up during intermission, and also after at the end of the play, the entire audience, at least at the show that I was at was talking and was communicating and there wasn't, um, you know, without resolution, it was sort of, there were, there was a sense of, of understanding, like, like you said, maybe something that people didn't, didn't know and there was a sense of validation um, and it was, I, I, has it been like that at, at the shows? Do you see the audience members kind of lingering? Um, I mean, we have a, feed in our uh, green room, most of the time we say, they think they could just walk onto the stage like that? They should, <laughs> why are they just milling about? That's our stage. Um, more, I, 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 you know, I'm not obviously there doing admission, but I'm, I'm just, I, I do see people after the show and it does feel like there's this buzz about it. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get to some of these questions. Why didn't Asaf view the video? Um, he doesn't view the video during the running time of the play that we watch. Mm -hmm. um, I've had people say to me, he meditates, and then the next thing he does is watch that video and go to the protest, and people say to me, I can't believe after all that he didn't go to the protest. So like, uh, uh, so, but I have a, a, less, a less dodgy and avoidant answer, and I, maybe you have an answer from the inside of the character. My less dodgy answer is, the reason he doesn't watch the video for most of the play, which I think the rabbi points to when she asks him, when she says there are different ethics, like no one's required necessarily to watch like a deep, the important question is why you didn't watch it, right? Whether you watched it or not. And I, th I think the answer to that is something to do with um, a desire not to feel something deeply upsetting and out of an uncontrollable, right? Uncontrollably upsetting. Uh, which has to do with a division between his brain and his body that the rabbi is also calling out. So that to even be the person who knows whether he needs to watch the video 
he needs to do the exercise that the rabbi is asking him to do first and get mm -hmm. out of his head and into his body. But I don't expect every single audience member to come away and be, and be like, that's exactly why. I don't know what your answer is, though. Can we also say that in the earlier draft of the play, he 100% watched the video? Yeah, when, when, that, when a... that wasn't the final scene of the play, he did. Yeah. And then it sort of impacted his decision whether to go to the protest, but then it was kind of too late because the police had already turned the protest into something else. Um, but, it, but to make it the final beat of the play felt, felt wrong for a variety yeah. of reasons. Yeah, yeah we, we, we talked about it when we realized we were going to be losing those two scenes. You know, we said the last action or the last picture of a play, whether or not the, the playwright and the director and the company intend it to be the kind of, this is what the play is saying, it kind of ends up being, this is what the play is saying. So were us off to watch the video and then go to the march, that would be saying, watch the videos, go to the marches. You know, that's, I think that's, we wanted to avoid something A that was- So sort of ex exhortative or perspective, yeah. yeah. The other thing that occurred to us is um, the, the concept, well, first of all, I want to say, <laughs> I, I you know, you go on social media and one of these videos come out, there's plenty of people saying, you have to watch this, you must watch this. There's also a school of people, a whole school of people say, protect yourself, you do not have to watch this. Mm -hmm. So it's very confusing what is the ethical, mm -hmm. correct, right, yes. progressive thing to do. And I have a number what of- What an ally does. Yes, what an ally does. Yeah. And I have a number of uh, black friends who told me, I did not watch the George Floyd video. You know, I did not do that, I, I protected myself. So. I feel, I'm, I, I don't know what, I, don't, I, I want to, maybe it's I'm feeling protective of Asaf, I don't, because sometimes when if you say he didn't watch the video and you hear people it would be like, oh, this asshole, you know, <laughs> and, and I want to be like, hey, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but maybe he, maybe he does. You maybe know, he does. Later. But, yeah. I, but I do think there's, um, the, the, the consequences of him not watching the video. This too. Is yeah. the, the relationship with Baron which, which has some real sweetness to it, mm -hmm. gets severed. And Baron is heartbroken and he leaves. And I made the point when we were doing a really deep dive discussion around this, like, what does he do now? He watches the video and then says, hey, Baron, I watched the video. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, like, it's already- It's broken. It's right. broken. Right. So his watching the video is not going, it's obviously not gonna mend that relationship. And I think that in the moment where the rabbi, he's with the rabbi, what he needs is to, to go in. And then, you know, there, the, it, Itamar didn't write the play after the play, but everyone else writes the play after the play. They take home and say, what, what happens? And there's a number of things that could happen. And I don't think, I think one of them might be he watches the video. Yeah, but at the very least understands for real why, why he didn't, which feels like the important question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, at the end, this is an audience question. At the end of the show, Josh's character is alone. Do you think there's no way to reconcile the perspectives? Uh, pass. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, if I knew the answer to that, I mean, the the, the if I the, I mean, I I I hope and suspect. Here's what I'll. Here's my real answer. I don't mean for him. I mean. Him being alone at the end um, to, to mean a couple of different things, one of which has to do with, yes, he's, he's isolated after like, these, these arguments and conversations that he's had, but the other is not negative, it's positive. It's that maybe, you know, if, if you really listen to yourself, what does your own inner voice actually say, which is something that's often quite hard to hear. Um, for me, uh, uh, in terms of reconciling perspectives, the dividing line for me has to do and writing the play and working on the play has helped me understand this. It has something that, that, that it's, it's, it has something to do with good faith and bad faith and understanding that there are people making, almost, like all of the arguments in the play can and are being made in good faith by some people, right? And that it's about the people of good faith who disagree finding each other and forging a way forward and that just because you can always point to people making certain arguments, whatever they may be, in bad faith, right, in order to advance some other more destructive agenda or whatever it is, that does not discount the good faith with which, this, it's, this is why it's very confusing, right, because this, but, but, if, but the ability to identify good faith 
which we don't have like a dowsing rod for. Right. But like, I think that's my answer, my actual answer to that question. Mm. I think, uh, I mean, when I first read the, the play and he still ends up, in the <laughs> early draft, he still ended up alone. <laughs> and I thought, well, he, he's alone and isolated like a certain country in the Middle East right. is. Um, but, I, but I think the, the more resonant, um, more, kind of more compassionate ending we found where Asaf is less punished and isolated, I think there's a difference between aloneness and solitude or loneliness and solitude. I don't, I don't necessarily know if his aloneness at the end is, you know, the rabbi says you feel despair, hate, love, hope, all these different things. He's alone with himself, um, and all of that is present. But I don't, it, it feels, I don't know, it feels more hopeful. I have, I have some faith that he is on a different path uh, towards, towards being able to hear that voice, you know? How is it going to, as we said, the, the, the play has been extended three times. It's now, you can see it again, <laughs> until April 7th. How do you think it's going to feel to you, Josh, to leave this character behind? <laughs> it's so funny, I just got really emotional thinking about it, so I don't know. We'll just have to extend it more. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I will be heartbroken, but I, I've been doing this a long time to know that there is a natural grieving process that goes on, not with every character. Some, you just like, some you're like, whew, thank God. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I'll, I, I, I think I haven't even, fully reckon with how much I have um, just kind of pulled him into me. I, 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 you know, I, my, my acting teacher at NYU used to say that a character is a 50% meeting of you and the character, you know? Like obviously I didn't grow up in the Bay Area, I don't have Israeli parents. Um, but there's, there was, there was, I don't know, I just see it as like I, I, I saw this character and I, I kind of welcomed him in and it'll take a little while to get him to, to say goodbye, yeah. As, as a playwright, do you feel like this, writing this and having this staged right now, has this changed you as a writer? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think writing it, but, more, but, but the more, even more so the process of just the two month rehearsal process of, of that, uh, was so intense and I, and I was so, I felt a lot of things going into it. One of them was scared. And I remember just deciding, I don't know how this is gonna go. I don't know what's gonna happen. I just wanna be able to look back on how I, the choices I made at each moment along the way in a, in a way that I can be proud of whatever the results are. Um, and, um, and so I, I think the intensity of that uh, I think has changed me in certain in certain ways, and 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 then also just um, I've just never it just it it just forced me to look really really hard at some things, and I don't know that it gave me clarity, but like um, yeah no I feel I I'm it's yes it has certain I I don't think I will know completely how or be able to articulate it for a while, but mm. I think I for sure changed by it, yeah. I do like what you said, you've said the few times that you wrote this play because you had all these questions you didn't know the answers to, and then you wrote this play and you still don't know the answers yeah, to yeah. any of the questions. That's I, true. I, I yeah, but now that. I know that no one else does either. That's the... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is the plan, um, I mean, until April 7th, do you want this, like, is your dream for this to be... I don't know, to, I mean, on Broadway... In, to well, if there are producers in the house, <laughs> I... Um, <laughs> No, I mean, uh, 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 uh. Are you gonna replace me when we go to Broadway? <laughs> is that what this is? Yeah. Um, look, uh, oh, I'm <laughs> don't, Chris don't, Hemsworth. No, no. Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's acting, anyone can play anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, <laughs> uh, 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 no, uh, 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 here's what I'll say. I, I don't know, I don't quite know. I mean, it's going well. Um, uh, what I'll say is, it is not an uh, it is not an easy play to do. It's not an easy play to act. It's not an easy play to direct. And this company and Lila's work on it and designers, I think, is just extraordinary. So 
I do think that while I want the play to have a big life and for there be other productions the way one always does for one's plays, I do think um, there would be, <laughs> I feel like there's value in this production because I don't, I don't know who, who else? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. this group, this director. So, uh, so I hope more stuff happens with it, but like that's not also not entirely under my control. Yeah. Um, I too hope that many people get a chance to see it. it it's an extraordinary show. Um, thank you both so much. I mean, so so much. I think everyone in this room feels so strongly about about this show and um, yeah it's mm -hmm. it's really it's very special it's really really special mm -hmm. I want to thank you all so much for coming yeah. thank Josh thank and Jessica Lisa. thank you thank you Jessica <laughs> <laughs> have a good night